Well, anyway, I want to also bring up tonight that on Monday marks a very important anniversary. It's the 150th anniversary of the congressional approval of the 14th Amendment. Now, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And what I would like is if anybody has any questions as I'm talking about this, feel free to raise your hand and uh, ask me because sometimes I assume that people know more than they actually do know. So anyway, uh, the importance of the 14th Amendment uh, is that at the end of the Civil War and after the passage of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, there were some big problems in the country. And the problems consisted of the fact that uh, Without any change, the South was actually going to get more representation in Congress. Now, a lot of you probably have heard in your history class, remember the Three-Fifths Compromise, where slaves were uh, counted as three-fifths of a person for the purposes of uh, congressional representation. Well, with slavery abolished, they were now counted as whole people, even though they didn't get the vote. So the South would get more representation in Congress and become more powerful. And that would mean that uh, they could reverse a lot of uh, things that were passed during the Civil War. Like, for instance, uh, they could, if they had gotten back into Congress right away, they could have uh, nullified the federal debt and they could have embraced the Confederate debt. And he said, how would that happen? How could they? They lost the war. Believe it or not, they actually thought they could do that, which just sort of shows you the incredible arrogance of the South, that they thought they could get back in there and that the North would pay for their war <laughs> against the North. But so that was another problem was the federal debt. And then you had the issue of who was a citizen. If some of you may remember that you had the Dred Scott decision, which said that uh, blacks, no matter whether they were free or slaves, were not citizens of the United States. In fact, after that decision, the Buchanan, uh, the Buchanan administration stopped issuing passports to black people, just as sort of a nasty thing to do to them. Uh, so you had also, you had the problem that the slaves or the freed slaves would not be able to vote in the New South. <coughs> And there was also the issue, what do you do with all of these Confederates were, who were unrepentant, and would you uh, give them the vote, and would you let them hold office? So all those issues were floating out there uh, after the Civil War. Now, fortunately, Thaddeus Stevens orchestrated a uh, effort to, or a plan to keep all of the ex-Confederates and their allies um, or their ex confederates and their allies out of Congress. And that was done on December 4th, 1865, which was another important anniversary. And we had a special program about that. And so I won't go into that tonight. But in any case, so you basically had a Northern dominated uh, Congress when they were considering these issues. And so the, they could be dealt with by legislation. Okay, they could have passed laws involving all these different issues. But that legislation, once the South got back into Congress, could be repealed. So an alternative to that was to, um, to have a constitutional amendment which would satisfy all these problems. And that particular amendment was the 14th Amendment. And on April 21st, 1866, Thaddeus Stevens introduced the first version of the 14th Amendment. And by June 13th, that's this uh, coming Monday, which will be the 150th, June 13th, 1866, it had gone through a number of transformations uh, which were approved by the Senate and had come back to the House for the final approval. Now, I'm sure you're all aware of the uh, comment uh, made by somebody that sausage making is something you never want to watch. And in this case, it was particularly uh, a real back and forth, things would change, you know, uh, parts were added on, subtracted, added on again, and so on and so forth. So, in the final analysis, what it did, the 14th Amendment, was it did establish that a citizen is a person who's born in the country. Now, that was the first time 
in our history where it had been uh, defined who was an American citizen. Before that, the states would define who was a citizen of the state, and then they would be considered as citizen of the United States. This is the first time they said anybody born in any of the states was a, member, was a citizen of the United States. Then it also, the 14th Amendment, also uh, said that all laws are to be applied equally to all citizens, that you couldn't make uh, specific laws for specific people. Before that, you could, believe it or not. And, and in fact, the Southerners did that right after the Civil War. They actually reintroduced, reintroduced slavery after the Civil War. What happened was the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, but there was a loophole. And that loophole was that it abolished it uh, for everybody except for convicts. Well, the Southerners made all blacks convicts. And they did that by saying, if you stepped off your plantation without a job, you were a vagrant, and you could be arrested and put back on the plantation as convict labor. So the, the 14th Amendment basically said, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> you have to apply the same laws to everybody. Uh, then it also, the 14th Amendment also said that citizens had uh, certain rights that could not be abridged by the state. Now that's always been a very amorphous issue about what that meant. Uh, the Supreme Court at one point said it meant uh, they all had the rights to pay tariffs or something to that effect. Uh, they, they defined it very narrowly. But in the 20th century, uh, it has been uh, expanded to say that all the rights that were listed in the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, apply on the state level. Lots of people don't realize that the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states until after what was called incorporation in the 1940s and onward, where they basically said, these are rights that people have and the states can't abridge them under the 14th Amendment. Uh, you also had a, a clause in there that the federal debt could not be canceled and they weren't going to be uh, paying for any Confederate debts. Okay. So, but there were a number of things that it didn't do. For one, it didn't give the vote to former slaves. And that was a big issue that uh, later was solved by the passage of the 15th Amendment in 1870, which gave the vote to blacks. Uh, also, it did not effectively penalize uh, southern states for restricting the vote. Uh, it had, there had been uh, proposals to basically say if you reduced the number of people who could vote, you get reduced uh, representation in Congress. But instead, they didn't like that, and so they said, well, it's going to be some sort of strange formula which involved <clears throat> denying the vote to males that are over 21. Uh, and, and in reality, they never enforced that particular portion of the 14th Amendment. And then also, another uh, provision that was in the original 14th Amendment was that ex-Confederates were not going to be able to vote until 1870. Um, okay. So anyway, Thaddeus Stevens had a number of objections to the way it all came out after it went through the sausage making uh, process. Uh, he was particularly upset about the fact that essentially the Confederates were going to get off without any sort of, uh, I guess you would say, punishment or restriction. He sort of felt like uh, creating a war where 600,000 people uh, had died, uh, that they shouldn't be able to vote for a few years. And, uh, and in, in Congress, at, at the, um, during the process, he said, uh, what would happen? He really feared that the Southerners would come back unre uh, unrepentant and basically start doing what they had done before the war. He says, that side of the house would be filled with yelling secessionists and hissing copperheads. Give us the third section or nothing. The third section was the one that would uh, restrict the voting. And then he also said, gentlemen tell us it is too strong, the restriction on voting. Too strong for what? Too strong for, the, for their stomachs, but not for the people? Some say it's too lenient. Is it too lenient for my hard heart? 
not only to 1870, but to 18070. Every rebel who shed the blood of loyal men should be prevented from exercising any power in this government. That even would be too mild a punishment for them. So he was really rather upset that none of the uh, Confederates, there was a restriction on some ex-Confederates holding public office if they had taken an oath in the past, but even that was lifted in 1872. So essentially the uh, Confederates got off pretty much scot-free. So in any case, um, he also had a more nuanced objection was that under that restriction of uh, you know how you would count representation, the, for the first time in American history, the word male was going to be inserted in the federal constitution, which he thought was a very bad idea. And he said, uh, during the, the discussion about that, he says, but I have another objection to the amendment of my friend from Ohio. His proposition is to portion representation according to male citizens of the states. Why has he put the word male into the provision? It was never in the Constitution of the United States before. Why make a crusade against women in the Constitution of the nation? Is my friend as much afraid of their rivalry as the gentlemen on the other side, the Democratic side, are afraid of the rivalry of the Negro? I do not think we ought to disfigure the Constitution with such a provision. I find that every unmarried man, which he was, is opposed to the proposition. Whether married men have particular reason for dreading interference from that quarter, I know not. <laughs> I certainly shall never vote to insert the word male or the word white in the national constitution. Well, I guess never say never, <laughs> because he did. He did approve the change uh, in the constitution where, and if you look at the 15th, 14th amendment, male is right in there. So anyway, on June 13th, 1866, he was the last person to talk about the amendment. And uh, I think he's, uh, what he said really summed up his outlook on life and also on getting what you can while you can get it. In my youth, in my manhood, in my old age, I had fondly dreamed that when any fortunate chance should have broken up for a while, the foundation of our institutions and released us from obligations the most tyrannical that ever man imposed in the name of freedom, that the intelligent, pure, and just men of this republic, true to their professions and their consciences, would have so remodeled all our institutions as to have rid them from every vestige of human oppression, of the inequality of rights, of the recognized degradation of the poor, and the superior caste of the rich. In short, that no distinction would be tolerated in this purified republic, but what arose from merit and conduct. This bright dream has vanished, like the baseless fabric of a vision. I find that we shall be obliged to be content with patching up the worst portions of the ancient edifice and leaving it and many of its parts to be swept through by the tempests, the frosts, and the storms of despotism. Do you inquire why, holding these views and possessing some will of my own, I accept so imperfect a proposition? I answer because I live among men and not among angels. Among men as intelligent, as determined, and as independent as myself, who cannot, who, not agreeing with me, do not choose to yield their opinions to mine. Mutual concession, therefore, is our only resort, or mutual hostilities.
And with that, the, the 14th Amendment was voted on uh, on, on June 13th, 1866, and then went on to be approved by the states two years later on July 9th, 1868, one month before Thaddeus Stevens died. So that's my presentation on the uh, approval of the 14th Amendment by Congress. So, do you have questions about Thaddeus Stevens in general, or about the 14th Amendment, or? Whether we should make it a hot national holiday? <laughs> I'm curious. Uh, say, I understand he under he uh, owned quite a bit of property and the two iron mills. How was he able to uh, acquire all of that? Uh, those resources that mm -hmm. he, was, he was a hell of a lawyer. That's basically the uh, answer. He he could have been he could have been a lot richer if he hadn't got involved in those iron mills, which just you know uh, drained him. Uh, completely, not completely, but drained him of all sorts of money. Uh, a lot of times he was working just to, um, you know, support the iron mills. But he was, he was very much into uh, uh, real estate buying, uh, real estate investment. He would buy it and then sell it, uh, had, uh, you know, renters and so on and so forth. And he had two iron mills. One was in uh, Fairfield, Moriah, which he had from 1826 to 18. 37, and then he moved the iron mill over to uh, Caledonia, and uh, it was that was he never should gotten into the iron mills. He was he was always losing money on those, and then the Confederates came around 1863 and burnt the place down. So, but he kept on doing it. I th I think by, there's a couple different theories as to why he would keep this iron mill going. One was that it was very uh, useful in uh, helping runaway slaves. Uh, a lot of uh, people felt that uh, you know that was one big reason. I also think he kind of liked owning his own town because he was an absentee owner, and whenever he came, there was sort of a big celebration, like the big man was here, and so on and so forth. <laughs> but anyway, he was a hell of a boy. I mean, he was basically the guy to go to see to fix things. I mean, he was like a super lawyer. Was the Caledonia area called Little Africa? And didn't he get there was jobs another area. There was another people who escaped over the border. Didn't he get jobs? Yeah, he would get jobs to fugitive slaves. Yeah, and there was actually Little Africa was sort of a settlement uh, around Caledonia. It wasn't the same thing. Okay. It was. It was. It was. I don't know. I think it was to the east. Uh, excuse me, to the west of uh, Caledonia, where Little Africa was. But did some of the workers from? Yeah, they came. They came from Little there? Africa and would live there. And, Okay. and work over in the uh, iron mill. Is it also not true, or is it true what the playwright says, that Stevens continued paying the iron mill workers uh, even when the operation was losing money? I'm not real sure about that. I thought I'd been a That's little, why I, 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 I might have been a little uh, Stretch. poetic. I mean, mm -hmm. let me put it this way. I don't know that um, he did or he did not. Uh, I don't think anything I've read actually says he would do that, uh, but I do know that he did pay their salaries after the Confederates came through and burnt the place down. Mm. So he ke did keep them on uh, so that they wouldn't uh, suffer any economic disadvantage. And what was it, Jubal Early, his response? Oh yeah, Jubal Early had a lot of good responses. He came through and, and uh, Thaddeus Stevens actually was at the Iron Mill a few days before Jubal Early came there to burn it down, and um, and there in the comments I've seen about it, that Thaddeus Stevens actually had to be persuaded to leave. Frankly, if Confederates were coming, I was Thaddeus Stevens. There would have to be no persuasion, yeah, to leave. I mean, you know, I I, I really would. It would have been interesting if they actually recorded what the conversation was like. Oh, I'm going to stay and convince them they're wrong, <laughs> or something like that. So anyway, he was convinced to take off, and he beat it off to uh, uh, Shippensburg. Uh, so anyway, when um, uh, Jubal Early showed up, the foreman Sweeney was his name tried to convince uh, Jubal Early not to burn it, saying that they weren't making any money there, they are just keeping it open for the sake of the workers. And Jubal Early's response was, Yankees don't do business that way. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, Sweeney said, well, you know, you've missed the, you know, Stevens, he was here a couple of days ago. And uh, Jubal Early said, well, 
if we had caught him, well, we would have hung him on the spot and distributed his bones to the several southern states as curiosities. So, mm. Jubal Early was not the nice guy. <laughs> so, is that... Uh, this is about the uh, play. I thought it was a really excellent presentation. I wanted to thank both of you. It was a wonderful job. I'm wondering if this is the first time you've done it, or has it, you've been enacting it for a while? Well, the background on the play uh, goes back at least to 2006, when it was presented in its full form. What you saw tonight was an extraction of a uh, full two-hour piece with intermission. Uh, it was originally commissioned, uh, written by Don Rhodes, Don Rhodes, who is Dean of Academic Studies at Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology in Lancaster. So the Fulton Opera House, uh, Fulton Theater, did a full production of this in 2006, which a number of us saw and were impressed and, long story short, thought it would be great to bring it as soon as possible to Gettysburg in a modified version. Uh, so the script went into revision. Uh, we produced it in the spring of 2007, in May, or April and May, uh, in Klein Theater, Gettysburg College Campus. I'm giving you the short version. Uh, very successful. It was the official theatrical component of the 175th anniversary celebration of the founding of Gettysburg College in that year. Uh, and since then, we have brought it back to various venues around the area, uh, in whole or in part. Does that help? And uh, yeah, you know, I, it's interesting that this uh, production, when we brought it to Gettysburg, opened the same week. Maybe some of you are familiar with this film I'm about to mention called Amazing Grace, uh, with Ian Griffod and Michael Gambon and a number of other stars. It's an Anglo-American production about the guy who is sometimes called the British Thaddeus Stevens, sometimes you hear Thaddeus Stevens referred to as the American William Wilberforce, after whom uh, the school Wilberforce University is named. This is the gentleman you may know. How many of you have heard of William Wilberforce, the British legislator from Yorkshire? Okay, who is one of the people credited with ending the British slave trade what, Ross, about a half a century before? 1807. Yeah. Uh, without a shot being fired. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so it took, it, uh, you know, making it sound simplified, but it's interesting that that movie opened the same week we opened this full play back in the spring. Well, I should say it opened, it came to Gettysburg Majestic Theater. It was kind of an interesting coincidence because you could go see uh, our play and then walk a few blocks and see the much earlier in time British version of it. How many of you have seen that movie, Amazing Grace? It's an amazing film. You can probably get it on Netflix. It's, it's a beautiful film. I mention it because the wrapping device, as we say in the Hollywood terminology, that is the uh, frame for that film is almost identical to this. And as far as I know, Don Rose, I've asked him about it, the play right here. Uh, he had not seen the movie when he wrote that, because it was at least a year, two years he was working. Uh, the framing device being in the movie that the aging, when the film begins, those of you who remember, the aging William Wilberforce in Bath, the resort town, is telling his uh, wife there in their 60s and 70s, uh, Barbara Spooner is asking him, as Lydia, as you just saw, about his background. Then we have the film as a series of flashbacks to these key moments in Wilberforce's legislative parliamentary career. He stood uh, for Parliament House of Commons from uh, Stafford, no, from Hull. If you know, it's a coast city in Yorkshire. Uh, and it's, the, the film, like this, is a series of historic flashbacks. So kind of interesting parallel. Okay. Yes. Uh, more landmark decisions of the US Supreme Court having to do with civil rights, equal rights, labor rights, education rights, have re relied on the 14th Amendment is controlling in decisions of those court decisions than any other aspect of the Constitution in the last 100 years. That's how important Yeah, the 14th Amendment essentially transformed the Constitution of the United States. Uh, the con a lot of people don't know this. The Constitution before, before the 13th and the 14th Amendment really only uh, was concerned with the federal government. It basically had restrictions to the federal government. It didn't actually dictate policy or conditions for the rest of the country. And that all changed first with the 13th Amendment, which basically said, can't keep slaves anymore. That was a state issue. 
before that. And then the 14th Amendment said, okay, everybody, everybody in your state who's born there is a citizen, and you have to apply the laws you know, equally to all those people. So yeah, it was, I, I call it the single most uh, important amendment to the Constitution. And I why, why would, in 25 words or less, why, I mean, I sometimes hear it said the 14th Amendment is the one that initially uh, legally guarantees us our basic human and civil rights. Is that an overstatement? Or yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and, it's, and it really is, uh, everybody knows all men are created equal from the Declaration of Independence, which has no legislative force. Uh, but it was only after the 14th Amendment that we actually had that as a matter of law that all people are equal as far as the law is concerned. And similarly, the importance of the 13th Amendment is is much greater than the Emancipation Proclamation. Oh yeah, the next president could have uh, could have repealed the Thirteenth Amendment. Repealed that, yeah. Right. Yeah. Basically, they could have just said, "Oh well, the war is over." The Thirteenth, the Emancipation Proclamation was strictly a war uh, action, uh, and it depended on the Southern states being outside of the Union. Uh, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people have this impression that Lincoln had this ability to get rid of slavery on his own. He didn't, it was only, it was only because the southern states seceded that he had that ability. If the southern states had stayed in the Union, we probably would have had slavery up until the 20th century or later. Because yeah. the Constitution mm -hmm. protected them. It was constitutionally protected. In fact, this was, this was a kind of an interesting thing and it sort of took me some time to figure out. There actually was an earlier 13th Amendment. Did anybody know that? There was an earlier 13th Amendment that was passed in, I think it was 1860 or 18, that was, it was right before the Civil War started. And in an effort to appease the South, because they were really anxious to appease the South, they proposed an amendment, which is called the Corwin Amendment, which essentially said, it was kind of a strange amendment, said, no amendment can be made to prohibit slavery. Hmm. Yeah, so it basically blocked another future amendment from, from abolishing slavery, which sort of seems kind of weird that you could try to do that. But anyway, it was actually passed by the House, passed by the Senate, and was approved by three states, I think Maryland, Michigan, or maybe it was Illinois, some other state, before the war got started so much and they just said, the hell with this, it's not gonna go anywhere. And actually Lincoln approved of the amendment, okay? Now you say, how could he approve this when it went against, or would seem to go against everything he said? Actually, in the, and the South really didn't care that the amendment was, because the thing is, it was kind of window dressing. Everybody who knew anything about the Constitution at that time knew that slavery was safe, okay, because it was protected by the Constitution. The South, uh, if it stayed in the Congress, would never have allowed any sort of amendment to go through abolishing slavery. And so they had a lock on it. Yeah, they, 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 slavery, in fact, Lincoln sent a letter to Alexander Stevens, who later became the Vice President of the Confederacy, saying, your slaves are as safe now as they were at the time of George Washington. There was no reason for the South to secede on the basis that their slaves were going to be free. However, the Republican Party's position was that they didn't want to see slavery in new states, in the territories, because up until that time, every time a free slave state would come in, the South would jump up and down and say, we, don't, we, want, a, we want a slave state, we want a slave state. You know? And so they would you know, compromise and all that sort of stuff. So we always had a slave state come in with a free uh, state, so on and so forth. The Republican Party basically said, no, we're not gonna do that anymore. It stops here, no more slave states. And it was because the, the South was so intent on expanding slavery that they went to war. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that's why you could, uh, they could have, frankly, the South didn't know what the, well, they just got crazy and just decided <laughs> they were gonna kick over everything and try to create their own nation.
Anyway, I could go on for hours about that. One of their <laughs> issues wasn't it that, mm -hmm. that if the, if we continue to add more states, right, that were free, wouldn't they have eventually well, say, say that, voted the South on slavery? Well, you know that is, you know, you, it, they still would have a lot of uh, power even with the new states coming in, and you do have a point. You would have more free states, states coming in, and they possibly could. But they still would have a significant minority to have prevented, you know, the elimination of slavery. I mean, it's tough getting an amendment of the Constitution through uh, because you got to get two thirds of both the House and the Senate, and then three fourths of all the states. So they they still probably could have stayed on with slavery. Actually, there was a whole issue that uh, they thought that if they could surround the uh, slave states by free states that it would be like surrounding a scorpion with fire and it would sting itself to death. That was a favorite metaphor for the Republican Party. Uh, that, that That's the only way they figured they could get rid of slavery. They knew they couldn't get rid of it uh, because it was a state issue. And uh, whether or not they would ever have enough free states to do what you said was kind of questionable. So anyway, I see people are wandering out, so I guess that's pretty much the oh, end wait, of it. I want to ask one more question. Okay, thing. good. good. I love more questions. I've been very interested in Stephen's 40 acres and a mule. Right. And I want to know what you know about that, because I think that's part of the reason why the South hated him. I mean, that was, I think, a big question after the Civil War. What do you do with the land of the South? What do you do with the free people? And right. 40 acres and a mule. For land reform. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. But uh, the during the war, there was the uh, a lot of the Southerners just abandoned their property, and particularly off, off the coast of uh, Georgia, there was just like uh, thousands and thousands of acres that were abandoned by planters. And um, uh, Sherman, uh, who was running around that area, uh, also had the additional problem that he had thousands and thousands of free blacks hanging around his troops. So he said, well, I got thousands of acres, I got thousands of blacks, I'll just give them the uh, acreage and they can uh, start uh, farming it, which he did. And it was going well. Uh, and that was sort of the idea is that the abandoned properties would be uh, distributed among the freed slaves. But Andrew Johnson, who was a Southern Democrat and also a bigot uh, said, "No, it goes back to the original owners." Okay, uh, so that particular effort uh, didn't come to anything, and Thaddeus Stevens wanted an even bigger uh, operation. He wanted to basically um, uh, to confiscate <coughs> the land of the richest ten percent of the population. Uh, of uh, of the South. Actually, it was a lot less than 10%. He wanted to take the uh, land of anybody who had more than 200 acres and then to redistribute it to the male, uh, to each male of uh, the freed slaves, 40 acres plus a stipend of $100 to get something started. And uh, it's amazing in his uh, but figures. But poor whites, hmm? I believe. It was to include poor whites, landless whites as well. They would they would sell to poor whites. Okay. They, they actually they were going to confiscate the property, distribute it to the forty to the uh, free slaves, sell the rest, pay for the war. Yeah. And it would also have have the uh, effect of distributing the, the land more broadly among the poor whites. It is amazing his figures. Uh, I guess they kind of reflect what we have nowadays. 70,000 out of 11,000 people who live, I mean 11 million people who live in the South, 70,000 people or 1.4% of the population owned 84% of the land in the South. Now, if, I mean, you're talking about a real aristocracy, mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, that was one other reason that he felt like it should be done was to actually have more of a yeoman farmer type situation. Well, the long and the short of it is, never got off the ground. You could never 
get it uh, approved by the House. Uh, and the legislature just wasn't ready to, yeah. uh, ex you know, to confiscate that much property. In fact, the freeing of the slaves is one of the largest confiscations of properties in uh, human history. Mm -hmm. so. Here, here's a, something I came across in an in a old history book in the Masonic Library in Philadelphia, Masonic Library. where I'm yeah. looking at Thaddeus Stevens and history about the 40 acres and, and the mule. It said that when the northern factory owners started thinking if we were to distribute the land in the south, our factory workers might think they should have some rights to land, and if this idea should catch on in the north, and we would lose our factory workers, our, our essentially wage slaves. And that is uh -huh. recorded as a conversation <laughs> I'm, that I'm sure, put the kibosh, sure they that, that, that really that. helped put the kibosh on the idea. But you mentioned that figure. I mean, the state of Florida, 1% of it's two-thirds of the private land. We still have very seriously, uh, very small numbers that control most of the land in the south. And the well, all around the great, country. all around the world. <laughs> but I mean, the great impoverishment in the southern states. It's but to be a, a lot of people, including myself, finished. believe that even if it had uh, been implemented, <clears throat> it would have been for nothing. Because after Reconstruction, the the Southerners laws were made for other people. Yeah, you know, and they would have just stolen land back. You know, they stole they stole the votes from the blacks. Uh, they basically assassinated any black officials that uh, you know would stand up to them. So they probably would have no problem stealing their land back, unfortunately. Well, it's been called the undiscovered, re undiscovered revolution in American politics today. Yeah. The land issue, the land reform, and I see signs of it coming forth again. Certain movements starting to build again for land rights. Because we don't have economic democracy. That's what we're looking at now. We're losing political democracy because of the gross wealth inequality. Mm -hmm. So we brought over the property system, the banking system from old Europe. Now, without any frontier, any more free or affordable land, is now creating this enormous wealth inequality and crushing us here. So that's why these basic principles of who owns the land, who should own the earth, are, are coming forward again. More things change, more things stay, stay the same. So, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me.